It's my pleasure to introduce my brother, Jared Williams. Uh, he is 12 years my junior, so he's my much younger brother. And so we had a really good time in Michigan. Jared actually was up there before Lenore and I moved up there. He's been with the Metro Church of Christ in Sterling Heights, Michigan for the last nine years. And in that time as the pulpit minister, they have more than doubled in size. Well, before COVID, we don't know what it all looked like after this, but um, when Jared moved there, there were about 80 members or so, and then they got up to a close to 200 in his nine years there. And so he has done an exceptional job in that regard. And it was really nice to be close to him for that little bit of period of time. But we are enjoying having him here over the holidays. And since my coughing fits are less than they were, but they still come on. So uh, I thought it'd be a good thing for him to maybe be able to step in and share a good lesson tonight. So Jared. You guys hear me? Is this thing on? There we go. Is that better? Yes? No? Okay. <laughs> it's good to see y'all tonight. I can say y'all here and nobody looks at me weird. That's not, they, I say y'all in Michigan and they don't seem to appreciate it as much as y'all do. So, that's, that's always nice. Uh, you know, I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you tonight. Thank you so much for your hospitality. This is a wonderful opportunity for me. Um, this, is, like Carrie said, you know, Carrie had 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 COVID, and we were all very worried about him and praying praying for him, as I'm sure all of you were as well. And I'm happy to take a little bit of the stress off of him. Um, he mentioned I am his much younger brother. I am 12 years younger than he is. I am 37. So now you all know exactly how old Carrie is. <laughs> But we all know, as Carrie just said, uh, we live in a different world. I appreciate uh, than we did a year ago, and I appreciate all the work that, that West Main is doing here to make sure that the church is stable and continuing to meet and continuing to worship and continuing to honor, and you're focusing on community, as we talked about this morning in Carrie's lesson, which I really appreciated. You know, Carrie talked to him this morning, uh, his lesson about, you know, we're going to think of time, and when this is over, we're going to think of time in terms of pre-COVID and post-COVID. I want to remind you of pre-COVID just a little bit. There are things that we say now that would make no sense to anybody a year ago that are commonplace to us today. For example, you know, you might hear a, a, a husband say to his wife, sweetie, have you seen my mask? I'm going to the bank. Or maybe you, you hear some Christians talking in the lobby after church on Sunday morning and say, Bob, I've never seen Bob be more rude to everybody here. He was shaking everybody's hands. We live in a very different world and I appreciate the fact that you are doing the things that Christians have always done when the world changes. Did you know that Christianity has been around for a changing world more than once? That we have gone through a ch changes in regimes, changes in empires, changes in power, changes in authority. But we serve a God who never changes. And we serve a gospel that never changes. That always seeks to save the lost. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing to keep that up. We join me in a word of prayer. Mighty God, Holy Father, Lord, again, we come before you thankful. Thankful for another opportunity to study your word. Thankful for another opportunity to worship you in song and to gather before your throne in prayer. To be reminded of the power that you put on display for us daily. And Lord, I ask that you make us dependent on that power that you help us to lean on you, not when we feel like we finally need to, but Father, by default. Help us to wake up in the morning and reflexively seek your power. Help us to lean not on our own understanding, but instead to seek your will in all things. And God, we ask that you help us to look for you as fully as you have looked for us. And in Christ's name we pray, amen. 
we're going to be taking a look at my favorite resurrection story tonight. Um, and I'll have a, an awful lot to say to you, and it's not overly complicated, but the simplicity of this verse and the simplicity of this story is what I find the most appealing about it. It's found in Luke 24. And if you want to go ahead and turn over there, you can. We're going to be taking a look at the section covering verses uh, 13 through 35. And as I said, this is my favorite resurrection story. There are several resurrection stories in Scripture. Things that happen after Jesus dies and is buried and is raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, as Paul tells us in Romans 6. But of all of them, this one is my favorite because it shows a side of Jesus that I don't think we think about often enough. An aspect of the character of our Savior that is something that we have all benefited from greatly as saved people. But maybe we have taken for granted. You see, we sing songs like, I have decided to follow Jesus, right? You've heard that song? I have decided to follow Jesus. We're familiar with it, right? Okay. That's great. Whenever somebody makes the decision to go after our Lord, to go looking for him, to follow after him, that's what it means to be a disciple, right? To follow after him. That's a great thing. But what I love about this story is this is a story not about somebody deciding, to go, deciding that they're going to go and find Jesus, like, say, the rich young ruler of Matthew 19. He went looking for Jesus. When he found Jesus, he didn't get what he wanted from Jesus, and he went away sad, and that's unfortunate, but he went looking for Jesus. But we're not talking about that person. We're talking about an instance where Jesus decided instead to go look for someone. He didn't wait for them to come looking for him. He went looking for them. I want to place this story in the context it, it belongs in. You're familiar with the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I hope you are. We have Jesus coming in to Jerusalem. Uh, it's recorded for us in the Gospels. Uh, particularly my, my favorite record of it is John 12 the triumphal entry, where Jesus comes in and everybody's so happy for him. They put him up on the donkey. They bring him in in a king's procession. They get the, the palm fronds and they start waving them up and down saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, that's great. Then they ask him, okay, so it's so great that you're here to kick the Romans out. And then Jesus says, I'm not here to kick the Romans out. I'm here to kick Satan out. And they go, oh, well, we misunderstood. Okay, bye. And they leave, leaving Jesus with basically just him and the twelve and a few others. Then Jesus tells them to go and find the, what we know to be the upper room, and they do that, and he gives them the money to take care of for getting the room. And Then we have the Last Supper. We have the, you know, focusing on Judas. Then Jesus goes with Peter, James, and John to the Garden of Gethsemane and he, on the Mount of Olives, and he spends the night there in prayer. He makes the very famous statement in, in, Matthew, in Matthew 26, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, and yet yeah, I will, but yours be done. Familiar with that. Then we have the arrest. Peter tries to stop the arrest. Ends up, you know, we talk about how hot-headed Peter uh, is. We never talk about what a terrible shot with the sword he is, because I doubt he was aiming for the guy's ear, but that's what he got. Jesus then heals the ear of the guard, of one of Caiaphas's guards. They take him before Caiaphas, the high priest, the Sadducee high priest. There is a mock trial, a kangaroo court that they set up, even though they've already decided his guilt. You know, that's what a kangaroo court is, right? Where your guilt has already been decided before the trial even begins. That's what happens. They railroad Jesus. They do that so that they can take him to Pontius Pilate before the Roman governor to have it argued that this man should be put to, get to death for his religious crimes. They charge him with blasphemy. Pilate meets with Jesus, talks to him for a while. They have a great, very philosophically and theologically deep conversation, but no matter what, even though Pilate finds him personally innocent, he knows he can't just let him go because Rome hates a riot. So he says, I wash my hands of it, I'll, 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 I'll scourge him, but that's not enough for them. 
That same crowd that was just a few chapters earlier in John 12 shouting Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna are now shouting a different word. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They do. They take him up to the place of the skull, to Golgotha. They crucify him. They put him on the tree. He's up there for about six hours and some change probably. Finally, he gives up his spirits, his spirit. They make sure he's dead by piercing his side with a spear. Blood and water pours out, which is probably the separation of plasma, which means he's been dead for a bit because his heart is no longer pumping. Then they take his body down. Jesus doesn't have a, a tomb of his own, so Joseph of Arimathea very, very generously offers his tomb. They take him, they bury him, they wrap him, and they think that's the end of the story. But we know better than that. Because on Sunday morning, the women come, hoping to get in. I don't know how they plan on getting into that tomb with the guards and the rock in the way, but they're going to try. They come to rub incense and ointment and perfumes on the body, and when they come, they discover that not only are the Roman guards asleep, but the tomb is open and what? Empty. They encounter the angel there who asks him a very, one of my favorite questions in all of Scripture. Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? They go back to the upper room where the other, where the other 12 are and the rest of the disciples are. They tell them what they saw. None of them believe him. Yes, Thomas is a little bit more direct with his disbelief than the others, but none of them really believe it. And Peter and John go to investigate they they run in peter and john go in and they discovered that not only is the tomb empty but the grave clothes are laying there and their folds as if there was a body in them at one point and now there isn't one but they haven't been torn open they haven't been cut open they're just empty now but still in the shape of jesus's body now what you're probably wanting to do if you're recounting this story and going over and i know we're paraphrasing a lot but you're probably wanting to jump ahead to the next big part of the story where Jesus comes into the upper room and he has his fabulous encounter with Thomas and Thomas makes his, his amazing declarative statement, one of the most sincere and direct and clear statements of the divinity of, of Jesus in all of scripture. My Lord and my God, right? But there's an event that happens between those two things. And they're recorded for us here in Luke 24. Now, normally Carrie reads from the New King James. I'm going to be reading from the ESV because it's objectively better. Luke 24, starting in verse 13. Now, you might have a chapter heading above verse 1 of chapter 24. It says, mine says, the resurrection. So this is the first thing that Luke records after the resurrection of Jesus. That very day, verse 13, two of them, two of them being two disciples, we know the name of at least one of them, Cleopas. One of the, the other's name might, might be Simon, but they could be referring to Simon Peter when it's not entirely clear which, which Simon they're referring to later. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, we're not sure where Emmaus is exactly. If you have a map in the back of your Bible, you can turn over there, and you might see one or two places that could be Emmaus. In fact, it's always nice when you look at a map and it says Emmaus question mark, <laughs> because we're not certain exactly where it belongs. But we know that it, we believe it's probably, it, it is probably west of Jerusalem, about seven miles away. They were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. Now, I want you to imagine being these two men. They are disciples. Now, I think a lot of us have a tendency to look at this word disciples and think to ourselves, well, they're disciples, but they're not Christians. You know, they're not like you and me. They're the guys that followed around Jesus before the death, burial, and resurrection. They didn't have the understanding that we have. They didn't have the Bible knowledge that we have. They didn't have all the, the benefits that we have in, as modern-day Christians. Let's not, let, let's not be arrogant with our own faith. Lest we forget that the word disciple is the most common term referring to Christians in the New Testament. We are called disciples 
vastly more often than we are called Christians in the New Testament, by the New Testament authors. These are two men who followed the same Savior that hopefully you're following tonight. They met the same Jesus that you met when you were saved. Amen? So let's remember, before we're too judgmental of them, that one of the reasons why we don't really see these characters outside of this story and we don't know much more about them than their names and the fact that they're on this road to Emmaus is because, honestly, I feel like these two men could be anybody in this room. I know I've been in a position similar to theirs before. And what position is that? Why are they leaving Jerusalem? Because they're devastated. Because the world has just ended for them. Because they showed up in Jerusalem with Jesus and everybody was shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then just a few days later, they were all shouting, crucify him, crucify him. But they still held out hope that, okay, Jesus is going to pull this out. Look at all the things that we've seen Jesus do. We've seen him feed 5,000 people with a sack lunch. We've seen him tell a storm to zip it, and it did. We've seen him turn water into wine to keep a party going. We've seen him do all these things. Surely he can overcome these silly Romans and they're just waiting with bated breath for that to happen. And then they see the scourging and they go, okay, maybe he's trying to make a point. He's, he's trying to be the underdog, kind of like a Rocky movie where he gets beat up real good but then he turns it around and he knocks Caesar clean out. But then that doesn't happen, does it? Because then he gets crucified. And then he dies. The hero isn't supposed to die. You know what my wife hates? My wife hates a movie where the hero dies in the end. Hates it. I think some of the best movies have the hero die in the end. Don't shake your head. That's good. <laughs> it's more inve it's, it's more, it, there's more investment. I think it's, there's something realistic about that. But whenever I would talk to her, I was like, why didn't you like that movie? She said, the hero died at the end. I said, what's the big deal with that? And she said, I, I don't watch movies to be sad. Can you see them making the same kind of argument? I didn't join Jesus to be sad. I didn't leave my life behind to be sad, to lose everything. I left my life behind so that I could gain everything. And then he dies? Are you kidding me? They just take off. Just the two of them. They kind of look at each other. They don't worry about what the others are doing. They look at each other and go, hey, Cleopas, you want to get out of here? And he goes, yeah, sure. Let's, let's do that. And then they just take off. Do you think they told anybody where they were going? Do you think they made sure that Peter and John and, the, and James and those guys knew exactly where they were headed and when they were leaving? Or do you think that they just hit the road? No one knows where Cleopas and his buddy is. But here they are, walking toward Emmaus, talking about how everything's over, the world has ended. Verse 15. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing them. And he said to them, what is this conversation you were holding with each other as you, as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. <laughs> you think he'd pull a road to Damascus. This isn't the first time that Jesus has met somebody on the road and it's not going to be the last, right? How does he meet Paul on the road? He shows up, big blinding light says, hey Paul, I'm Jesus and you should probably start worshiping me now. And Paul does. Big, bombastic, heaven splitting open, trumpet sounding kind of an entrance. Does he do that here? Why does he do that to Paul? Because Paul didn't know him yet. And first impressions are everything. But guess what? These two, they know him. Does he know who they are? Of course he does. They're his disciples. So he goes up to him and he disguises himself and he goes, hey guys, what are you talking about? as if he's just some other traveler on the road. Then, get this, 
He keeps walking with them, not back towards Jerusalem, but to where? Emmaus. He joins them on their journey away from where they need to be, where the action is. Now, what is Jesus doing by asking them these questions? What are you talking about? What are you all talking about? And look what they said. They said they were sad. Verse 18, one of them named Cleopas answered and said, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? Why is Jesus asking that? If anybody knows what happened, who, do you think Jesus knows what happened? Yeah, he was kind of there for it, right? But why is he asking this? Not because he's curious about this. He doesn't have amnesia or anything. He's testing them. I really hope this never happens when I'm... See, I'm on a trip right now with my, with my family. You know, we're, we're away from home in Michigan, and it's, it's great to be here. I really hope at no point during this trip or during my way home back to Michigan, like if I'm at a gas station, I hope Jesus doesn't roll up to me and test me like he's about to test these two. Because I'm afraid I'd fail. If Jesus just rolled up to you out of the blue and said, Hey, um, tell me what, about what happened when I... Uh, died and was buried and rose again. Did you know that Jesus is into pop quizzes? That's what this is. He says, what things? <laughs> and they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet. Church, pick up on something there. What tense are they using? Are they using present tense? Are they using future tense? Or are they using past tense? Are they saying Jesus who is a prophet? Or are they saying Jesus who, what? Was a prophet. What does past tense imply? That he's not a prophet anymore. We know better than this. Automatically this is an F because we know that if Jesus comes to you and tests you, I'm going to help you out. Because whenever you're talking about Jesus, he's never past tense. Jesus wasn't our Lord and Savior. He is our Lord and Savior. Amen? So they got that wrong. But you can hear the dejection in their voice, and they say, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was one of, the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. There's that past tense again. What does that mean? Do they hope any longer? Why are they on the road to Emmaus? Church, if you listen to anything tonight, listen to this. Why are they on the road to Emmaus? What caused them to pick up and head out of town towards Emmaus? They lost all their hope. Their hope left, and so did they. The way that Luke orders events, Jesus woke up on that Sunday morning, that Easter Sunday morning. He got out of that tomb, and the first thing he did was not go and find Peter, James, and John. He didn't track down his mom to let her know that, hey, I know you, you saw me get murdered a couple of days ago. I'm fine, by the way. He didn't check on Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He went looking for Cleopas and his buddy. And you go, who's Cleopas? And I say, exactly. Because we don't know who Cleopas was, really. We don't know who his friend is. He might be named Simon, maybe. That's all we know. But guess what? Jesus knows who they are. He knew they were on that road. He knew they were without hope. And what does he do? He goes and he goes looking for them. And when he finds them, he doesn't lightning bolt them. He doesn't split the heavens open and show up and say, hi, I'm Jesus. You better stop worshiping me. Remember me. He doesn't do that. He goes up with them. He talks with them. And he journeys with them. He walks up to them and says, hey, guys, where are you going? Can I come too?
Verse 22, Cleopas continues, Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that, he had never, that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women said, but him they did not see. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that these guys were there to hear the women's report. They were there to, they were there to see Peter and John go off and check it out and come back and tell them what they found. And they still didn't believe. They still left. They thought, well, then somebody stole the body. Great, somebody stole the body. And they took off anyway. They're so hopeless that they couldn't even hear the good news that the tomb was empty. I love what Jesus says to them in verse 25. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. These guys were preached the gospel in evangelistic terms by Jesus himself after the resurrection. Not before, after. How cool is that? That they got to hear the gospel about Jesus proclaimed to them by Jesus himself. He tells them how foolish they're being. Oh, you completely tanked that test I just gave you. Let me tell you where you went wrong. Here's why I had to die, even though he's keeping those cards a little close to his chest. But then we keep going. Verse 28, so they drew near to the village which they were going. So now they're almost to Emmaus. And he acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. How long do you think this took? I mean, yeah, it's only seven miles from Jerusalem, but they're on foot, y'all. And it's probably uneven ground. It's probably not a flat interstate all the way there, right? I imagine it whines a little bit. This probably took all day. Doesn't Jesus have stuff to do and other people to go see, more important people to connect with? No. He walked this road with them, got to Emmaus, and when they asked him to stay, he stayed. Verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Here's something interesting and it's a, it, it is somewhat speculative but I can't help myself. What day of the week is this? This is a Sunday. This is Resurrection Sunday. And what is Jesus doing? He's breaking bread with them. Do you remember what he said to the apostles in the Last Supper? He said about the bread and the cup. He said, this is my body, which is offered up for you. This is my blood, which is poured out for you. I will not eat of it again until I am what? With you in the kingdom. Well, guess what? The kingdom's a thing now because the resurrection has happened. And what does he do? He breaks bread with these two. These nobodies. This isn't Peter and James and John. This isn't his mother Mary. This isn't, this isn't Lazarus. This isn't Pontius Pilate. This isn't even Paul. These are just some random dudes. And who's the first person that Jesus has a meal with after he's raised from the dead according to Luke? Them. Why? Because they were on that road without hope and Jesus was not about to leave them behind. Do you see why this is my favorite resurrection story? The end of the story goes as this. Verse 31, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. That must have been disconcerting to see Jesus teleport like that. Poof, he's gone. Verse 32, they said to each other, 
Did not our hearts burn within us? Church, hear that tonight. Did not our hearts burn within us while he taught to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, back another seven miles the other way. And they found the eleven and those who were with them and gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Again, that might be a reference to another Simon, but I believe it's probably Cleopas and his friend Simon that they're talking about. Verse 35, Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the of bread. Then we have Jesus come into the room without using the door, and we have the interaction with Thomas. What does it say? It says that Jesus vanished, right? That he's gone. Then they get up and they walk back the seven miles to Jerusalem. What does that mean? Before Jesus goes into the room and Luke records them, him eating with him, with them again, that means that Jesus waited until these two got back to that room until they were home again. I told you that this is my favorite resurrection story, and I'll leave you with this. This is my favorite resurrection story. You know why? Because it is a practical application of my favorite parable. You know what my favorite parable is? My favorite parable is the story of the prodigal son. It's my favorite one because I identify with it the most. You know the story of the prodigal son, right? Gets all of his dad's money, goes off into the city for some footloose and fancy free living, wine, women, and song, wastes everything, ends up homeless in the worst place that a living Jew can be in a pig pen, realizes that his father's slaves eat better than this, So what does he do? He gets up and he says, maybe I can talk him into letting me be one of his servants. And he goes and he walks back home. And when the dad sees him on the road, what does he do? He runs. Dads in in Second Temple Judaism didn't run, y'all. It was very, very, very embarrassing to look at. You had to grab that robe and hike it on up and show him your pasty white ankles and you have to run. And it doesn't look very, very patriarchal. But he did it. Why? Because he was so happy that his son was home. And his son was practicing the speech, Dad, please, you know, like, let me work for you. Let me, let me be your servant. I won't make a fuss. You know, you don't have to give me anything other than a roof over my head and something to eat, three meals a day. That's it. That's all I require. He doesn't get any of that out because when Dad sees him, he wraps his arms around him. He says, my son who was dead is now alive because Jesus longs for the life of those who are dead. Church, do you know that tonight? Peter tells us that God desires that none should what? Perish. But all should come to saving knowledge of him. Jesus knew that these two were on the road and that they were dying. Sure, they're not big spotlight characters. They're not James and John and Peter. They're not those guys. They're not Paul. But it doesn't matter to Jesus because Jesus wants them to come home. He knows they're headed out of town. So what does Jesus do? Well, I'm going to wait for them to come back to me. What did he do, church? He dropped everything. He put meeting the others on hold and he went looking for them. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been on this particular road? Have you ever been walking down the road to Emmaus yourself without hope? Given up? You think anybody has been on that particular road this year more than any other year? I've been on that road. And yeah, there have been times where I've come to my senses and I went looking for Jesus. But there have been plenty of times where Jesus came looking for me.
That's why this is my favorite resurrection story. Because maybe tonight there's somebody in this room who's on the road. Who hasn't been looking for Jesus. But needs to hear tonight that Jesus has been looking for them. And the church said, Amen. If you have any need of this congregation tonight, no matter what it is, if you're on the road and you want to come home, all you have to do is come while we stand and sing.